Susan, Scott, welcome to Menorca. Thank welcome. You. Oh, thank you, Jorge. And <laughs> yes. Well, so, well, first of all, who are Susan Lyon and Scott Burdick and what are they doing in Menorca? <laughs> oh, well, I, it sounded exotic and beautiful and your videos just really, I'd never heard of Menorca before, so I have to say that's my ignorance. But when I looked at your website and I looked at the videos, it was like, whoa, this is so beautiful. And I thought, why not? We, you know, why not come to this beautiful place that, you know, you make it nice, everyone stays together, and you get to know the students, and you know, everybody separates after class, so... I oh, we're glad you liked it. Yeah, no. <laughs> Are you liking it this far? Definitely. Yeah. It's yeah, I'm here because Sue said, <laughs> we're going to go to Menorca. I kind of said <laughs> that. Because she saw your video, you contacted her, it looked beautiful. So I really didn't know what much to expect. I was busy with things, so I really didn't... Uh, pay much attention. I read a little bit about Menorca's history, which is interesting, but when we got here, uh, I was just amazed because we've taught at other places that are not too well organized or the lighting's not good, but you guys really did. I guess being artists, um, you guys really knew what an artist wanted in a studio and lighting and just everything. It was amazing, but even beyond that, just the island and really ju even just the place we stay here, there's so much to paint here that it's just like an artist's heaven. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna stay you know, uh, uh, a few days afterwards as well and rent a car and having our friend uh, Kathy Anderson and her husband come. And so we're gonna paint, get to paint the island as well. But uh, yeah, absolutely inspiring. But I didn't really know what to expect beforehand, yeah. Great, well, thank you. <laughs> we're glad to have you here. <laughs> and uh, well, one of the things that uh, is interesting is that you live together you work together, how do you balance that? Because people usually say don't mix work with your private life. How do you balance it? How's it going? <laughs> well, we don't really see each other during the day. People ask us all the time, like, why don't you share a studio? Oh my God, we, we have no way, no way. Um, we need separate. We paint differently. We, have, we like to listen to different things when we paint. Um, and Scott tends to paint, like he will paint for 10 hours straight and he'll paint sometimes way into the night and I am more of a scheduled person where I wake up and I paint during the day and then I go to bed early so he paints, when he gets excited it's all or nothing where I'm definitely more even but we are, we're different, yeah. um, you know we have different comp Maybe you can explain it, but... Oh yeah, I mean, we're different, definitely, like Sue said, she's more steady and she'll work every day. Um, and I get really excited about things and I'll just be working non-stop on a, a painting project. And then I kind of get burned out and then I take a break and I'll go weeks, sometimes even months without painting. And I will um, just read or write or, or go hiking, do other do things like that. Or do videos. Do videos or whatever. Uh, make a little documentary or something and then I get excited about painting and it's just non-stop painting so we have different ways of working but the good thing about both being artists is that um, it's probably the one of the few things we have in common is that you know we can go on trips to places that we like to paint that are different than other people would like to go not a lot of people would like to go way off into the back you know country of Tibet or of India or of all these places and we both love to paint people um, and so when we are on those trips, then we can hire models together and, and paint together and, you know, go through the hardships of getting to some of these, these out-of-the-way places that most husbands or wives really wouldn't want to do, so. About those things, you like this kind of subjects, exotic subjects, and is it more about the subject itself or is it just more about the moment, the memory of that moment? I mean, it's just like when you take a photograph because you want to keep that moment in your memory, or it's just because of the subject itself? I think it's obviously a little bit of both. It's an excuse to travel. Um, and it does, it is definitely in the moment, though. Some of the most glorious times are when you're traveling and you're painting somebody and you can't even speak the language. But just the fact that you're painting them and you get to study their face and stare at their face 
And then they see you, they get to come up and they see you painting them and see the painting and they get so happy and their family watches. Um, you realize that you don't need to speak the same language. It's, um, or Scott will paint somebody's boat in a harbor or a house and they just love and they want to watch. Or he'll let a little kid paint on their painting. It's, it's definitely a language that is, brings people together. Um, but I guess we are figurative painters but we are attracted to drama, we're attracted to color, we're attracted to costume, I guess in a better word. I mean, we love to play. So even if we're home and we have a regular model, we love to play and make them look like gypsies or um, you know, a Virgin Mary or something. It's just fun. You know, sometimes Scott loves to um, the juxtaposition. Like if we were painting an American Indian in the out west, he loves the fact that half their outfit is traditional and half of it is Nikes and a baseball hat or something so you can yeah yeah I, I mean I definitely like to paint whatever it is the people are wearing now Sue, Sue definitely will do a little bit more in the studio really dressing people up the way she wants she has an image in her mind whereas I tend to be a little bit more documentary in, in my viewpoint when I go to a place I'm not like like a lot of times when we go to Native Americans or other, other places, they'll be like, would you want me to dress up, you know, bring me some costumes? Like, no, I like to paint you the way you are. And sometimes that is their traditional outfits. That's how they're still living. And then other times it's modern. Sometimes it's a mixture. But I do, I do think that, I mean, obviously now we have such a vast amount of photographs from all of these trips. We have more material than we could ever paint. So going on trips isn't just simply because it's, a place to get material to paint. And, and some of the places we go might be harder to sell just because they're not the subject matter people are looking for. But it is definitely just exciting to learn. So even if it's nothing that comes into the painting, it's fun to go to a place. I like to read about the history and the religion. I like to talk to people about their views on things. And you just, you learn some startling things when you go out there that actually come back on yourself. You'll be looking at somebody and their views and you're like, wow, that's so curious that they would think that. And then you, you think, well, God, what things am I not taking for granted that I believe always thought? And, then, and that happens all the time where you go on a trip thinking that you're going to learn about somewhere else. And you actually end up questioning some things that you've always thought and changing your mind on. So it's it's... That's probably, for me, the funnest thing. And, um, and I try to put that into my stories more than my paintings. It comes through the visual element in the paintings. But um, it's, it's, it's just, even if you never share it with anybody, you've grown as a person. So. Great. So and do you find uh, harder to find uh, exciting subjects at, at home? Do you, because you moved from, from Chicago to North Carolina, mm -hmm. does it has to is something with environment or was well where we live the the only bad thing about it is that you don't have as as wide variety of ethnicities whereas you go to chicago you go to new york you see every person in the planet and that that does excite me i love seeing different faces um so yeah i think in general we travel too to have intensity. It brings intensity to your life because at home, we it's safe. We you know it's easy where we live. It's very it's easy and calm, and it's it's sort of rural, so we don't have to worry about traffic or crime or all kinds of stuff. And we travel. You know, it's that's you know people go on vacation to relax. We go home to relax. At home is relaxing. So we do these trips to um, create memories and to. Um, you know, seek out experiences and um, bring that sort of, you know, I guess, drama. But yeah. I, I'd say the more exciting paintings come from trips, for sure, for us. I mean, I think that's probably what we have in common. Yeah. And a lot of times, uh, we used to always have a show after a trip. So if we went to China, we went to India, maybe a year later, we'd have a show of China or India. And, I mean, I guess that creates interest because you see a theme and you see the difference between us. Um, it's funny, I always tell this story because we had a show about Tibet and, you know, Scott was painting everybody, like really crazy looking people and, you know, like he never changes anything to make them look better. 
And um, so he paints the character of the person, whereas we'd paint the exact same person and I would make them look like they're from Disneyland because they're so happy and soft. And I'm trying to get better at not um, softening people's character. You know, like, I, that's why I want to paint more men, because like sharp edges, angles, you know. Um, but it was sort of a joke when they would look at our show and everybody was, mine were all happy and soft and his were all like, like sometimes we'd look well, at his I, paintings and we'd be like, that's never going to sell. Like that, and someone will buy it. Like somebody wants the grittiness that, you know, somebody's tooth hanging out and like this. And <laughs> but it, that's the fun of also doing art too, is that you, we don't want everything to be pretty. I fight that because my tendency is to be soft. So... I mean, but it's not that I want that to be. I think as artists, as, as a teacher too, I realize that intellectually what we know and what we can do sometimes is different. And, you know, I mean, I want to be, have more character, um, but <laughs> I just generally like, you know, anyways, what you want to it talk is, about. It is fun though, yeah. What Tibet was, was, a, was a very contrasting show. And it was an intense time when we went there because there was... A lot of political things too and so you know like one painting I did was of um, a whole family a traditional family because people there had to actually get permission if you were Tibetan uh, from your local uh, who's running the Chinese uh, area of your thing you had to get permission to travel to anywhere else in Tibet and so people would come up like in Lhasa when we finally got there because we drove in from China across the whole country it took six days yeah just driving to Lhasa and um, so people would, police would come up to people and um, ask them for their papers and they would get them out and, and if they didn't have them they would just be arrested, you know, immediately. And of course if you were uh, an immigrant from China there, you could just travel freely. So it was very similar to like the United States and the way it used to be with the uh, reservation system. They couldn't leave the reservations freely. And so one of the paintings I did was of this family, a traditional family, and you know, out from the hinterland. And you saw them standing and looking over, and the little girl pointing, and and they, they were pointing at was somebody being arrested for having not having their papers. And so, so again, I think it's like I, I tend to sometimes do a little more documentary sort of a thing. Like so, that to me was an interesting scene to paint. Didn't actually paint the arrest itself, but seeing the fear and the expression on the people's faces was interesting uh, to me. And, um, but that's what's cool, is that two people can go to the same place and see completely different things and see a completely different side of it. Her side was as true, because we, we met lots of people then who were super happy and wonderful and excited right. to see us. So it was what we were choosing to show of that, which is our own interest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think, though, that, you know, just to be completely honest, your, your ability is better at painting large epic paintings. Oh. Um, I mean, my technical skill is just, I'm you know, not gonna paint a life-size painting with 20 people, but he can. Mm -hmm. And my, my ability is just a little bit smaller, a little bit more intimate. Um, I guess it's all about what inspires you and what you really push yourself for, but I'm a slower painter, so paintings would take me. <laughs> It would take me two years to do what you did. So, and you, you, you really like painting big. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also related mm -hmm. with both of your techniques. I mean, mm -hmm. but is it more like a consequence? I mean, being you more like brush crocky or you more soft painting? Does the roughness and softness is a consequence of your technique? Or is it the technique, a decision for getting to that? I think it's a reflection of your personalities. You know, definitely. You know, Sue's definitely a nicer person, a softer person, you know? <laughs> and she true. looks for that in people, you know? And I tend to be uh, reading the newspaper more and stuff like this. And like going to a rally when there's a protest. And she's like, I don't want to you a there. rough guy anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tend to, yeah. To, to, it could be the yin and yang, the male yeah. feminine thing, yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, but that's, that's what's great about art is, you know, two people, even the same model, you can have the same model especially more advanced artists. When you have the same model, everybody is, you look at everybody's painting and you think, wow, yeah, that's accurate, that's correct, and yet it looks completely different. 
But yeah. what about your training? Was it similar or? Yeah, same. We went to the same school and had the same teacher and all that stuff. So yeah, but you take those basics and then in fact, our whole group of people um, who we painted with, you know, I mean, uh, Rose Franson and Dan Gerhardt all went to the same school, had the same teacher, Tim Lawson, um, Nancy, Nancy Guzik. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people that we all went to school together with. And when we got out of school, we all painted very similar uh, to each other. You would almost would think they're the same kind of a painter almost. And then each year you would see people uh, diverge more and more and more from each other to, to now people will be like oh my god you went to school with Tim Lawson that's I never would have thought that you know so we have completely different styles and techniques and uh, so that's more that's what you hope for is to take those basics and then take it in your own direction it just slowly happens it's not like a conscious thing oh I've got to not paint like this person so in your case, Scott, you also, uh, I believe you work for Trainworks as well. Well, just for... Does like, that affect any way in your... Just for like three months. I worked there for, for a very brief time. I went to, after art school, I went to film school part-time, just taking the film, not taking like math and English for a bachelor's. And I took writing, film, and photography. And I had always been interested in th all three, painting and those. And um, so I studied that. And then I went to DreamWorks because I'd, I used to teach some classes in Las, like a workshop once a year and, and there. And so I met a lot of uh, the artists from the different film studios uh, and um, they would take the class. And we went out for a show in California and um, found out that they were cheating us. They had been raising the prices and things. And I'd had this happen at a few other galleries. Dan Gere, Hart and I had a show in Scottsdale. And they wouldn't pay us. And I was actually getting really frustrated with the fine art world. And so I, several of the artists I had come to the opening that were from DreamWorks and I, um, uh, so I was like telling them how, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna pull out of this gallery and I'm really sick of this. And they're like, and they're like oh, why don't you come to DreamWorks? We'll give you a tour. But then they set up a meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg and things. So I worked there for three months on development of a movie called Spirit. Well, you worked from home. I worked from home and then I, would, I flew in uh, a couple times too for the meetings, but I would just send in my, my writing and my paintings uh, that we all worked on. It was developing the story for the movie. And then after that I was to decide if I, I had to move out there um, to, uh, if I wanted to work there full time. And I just decided I didn't really want to work and live in Los Angeles. And so, um, so it was fun. It was interesting. And I wrote a couple of uh, screenplays uh, for them too and uh, presented it. And uh, none of them got made, but uh, it was an interesting experience. But that had always, since art school, that was always a dilemma because I had no money in art school at all. And the movie studios and illustration places would come in and recruit every year at the academy. Don Bluth and Disney and all these places and Hallmark and, and, and the um, illustration places. And I got offered jobs and it was very different. Nancy Guzik was the same. It was very difficult for us to turn down these jobs in animation or in illustration um, because they paid a lot of money. And um, but I always and a lot of our friends did take those jobs, really good artists, and then and work there in the industry now still. Um, but I always just decided no, I would like to try and you know do my own thing. So um, yeah, so I didn't work there long, but it was very interesting. I, I I I liked it, and all the artists there are so so good and inspiring. Yeah. Well, they all. I mean, that was the thing is that all the artists we met who did animation wanted to have your life right and you realize that once you got there you're like oh the grass isn't greener no right oh right they kind of all want to leave their jobs <laughs> right i do have it good oh so it's always this sort of like something can be better but it's really not oh right because they're making so much money but their overhead was so much Every time we'd go to Los Angeles, we'd see how much they had to make every month that they could never quit their job. They could never be a fine artist because they would have to go back. They'd have to like start from the beginning. And it was just way too difficult for people to give up paychecks. And we always, in the beginning, lived paycheck to paycheck and it was perfectly fine for us. We didn't mind, we always made just enough. And then, you know, we moved from Chicago to North Carolina so that we could travel because having a high rent, it always felt like you were throwing money away. And so when we moved to North Carolina, it was easier because our, our mortgage was so low and the house was so cheap 
that we could start traveling and, and you know, in our over... Like right now, we don't have any overhead and we haven't for like 15 years because, and we refuse to ever go in debt. We only do things if we have the cash. Um, and I know that that's very, very difficult for other artists, especially ones that live in um, California or other places. They just are constantly having to do workshops, constantly having to do commissions. And um, I just don't, I think we just wouldn't be able to live with that stress. Yeah, because you never know when you're gonna sell something. Yeah. And so once you start having you know, mortgage, debts, car payments, things like this, um, then when you do, you're always going to hit slow times. And then all of a sudden things will just start selling again. But how do you get through a six month slow time when you have all of these commitments? So for us, it was more important to live in a, in a more inexpensive place and ha get rid of all the debts. That way, if things well, we do slow down. we never had debt. Well, Except the for our rent. was the only time we had. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we, uh, we were real strict about not buying mm -hmm. things that we couldn't afford because because we do know some really great artists that would have that happen and they'd end up having to go to work at a school or even even a regular job and stuff or like for me I would probably have to take a job at a film studio or something like that if you had all that and I just didn't want to uh, or take commissions and so um, so that was what was most important to us was having that freedom to paint what we wanted to and then when we get the money we uh, you know uh, travel and so it's fun yeah so I guess that your relationship now within the art world, I mean, galleries and all that stuff is better because you told him it's the beginning was not very good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about when he was cheated? Oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that nowadays, I guess, so, because there's always kind of a delicate relationship mm -hmm. within the art world. I mean, yeah. what do you not like about the fine art world and yeah. business? Is there anything you really well, don't like is, about it? We get especially at workshops, which is interesting, we haven't had that question here, is that most every workshop people want to know, how do you get into a gallery? How do you sell artwork? And galleries, it's like dating because they're human beings and you figure out, do you work together? Um, are they going to tell you the truth? Um, can you, do you feel comfortable with them? Um, so it's always a little bit, you know, we find that sometimes the best um, galleries will last for a few years for us and then it's the person who's running the gallery so if they get ill if they get old if they get divorced you know then it goes to somebody else it changes drastically um, so through the, our longevity is that we've just been very flexible and we've spread ourselves out so we don't have all of our paintings at one gallery um, because if that gallery goes under then we'd be like, what on earth? So we spread out different galleries to the United States and we have different shows. So they, like every six months or every few months we have something going on. But you know, even the best of galleries we've had issues with, they go through hard times. Um, we've had galleries where, you know, like they're having personal problems. So they're not telling you the truth. <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's hard to like deal with that. But the fact that we, don't have the overhead or we have each other too I think to bounce off uh, like if if something is like say Scott's having a problem with the gallery it's easier for me to like protect him and call him up and say what's happening and then if that happens to me it's easier for right. you to do it because sometimes it's really hard to stand up for yourself but you when you have a partner doing that it, it's you protect them so much more and you, you tell them it's all right we don't need that gallery whereas other people if they feel really alone and they don't have, feel like they have the power to stand up for themselves so they don't s negotiate commissions. You know, they don't, if the gallery tells them, what happens is a lot of times galleries will start telling artists what to paint. They feel completely obligated to do that. Um, for us, maybe because we're a little bit contrary, we're like, no, it's not. You know, we've had, I've had many galleries tell me we don't want drawings or Scott, we don't want this, or we don't want that. And we're like, hmm, okay, you know, that's, well, that's what we're doing. <laughs> you know, if you don't want it, okay. But usually what happens is they back down because you, they need you just as much as you need them. And I think what happens is a lot of artists that I know, they, they get too scared to do that. And if you show confidence, the gallery will have confidence in you. And 
commissions um, is a, a perfect example because all galleries will tell you that they're only 50% with everybody and you have to help us with advertising um, unless you say no. <laughs> it, it's just, but you know, if you're told that and you're an artist and you have never talked to another artist and don't understand that everything is negotiable, that no, they're lying to you and that when a gallery tells you, by the way, don't tell anybody else what's happening, uh, that's a red flag. It's just, I think because we've had longevity and we're a little jaded, we realize that that's not the way it is. And so we try and tell the truth to people as much as possible. Um, yeah, young artists will mm -hmm. contact me and ask things about it. And it's funny because sometimes they'll be in the same gallery as me and they'll, and I'll say, well, this is what the commission I'm at and, and such and such is that and everybody is. Even though the gallery, when they then go down on their commission for you, because they'll do it immediately because they want you in their gallery once you get well known. Um, that, but they'll say, oh, don't tell anybody, you know, what, what, what your commission is. You know, they don't want you to tell the other artists. But of course, we care more about the other artists. So we, we all bond to, together and you do that. Uh, it's different when you're starting out, certainly. Uh, once you have a name, it's easier to get into new galleries or deal with them. When you're starting out, it's very difficult. Uh, and I, my best advice to artists when they're beginning is to go with a gallery that is really excited about your work, that really loves your work. Just because it's a big, famous, well-known gallery, don't think that's the place to try and desperately to get into, that if you're in this big gallery, because if your paintings are just selling for $500, you know, like when we started out, I was selling for $75 and um, in the first gallery I was with out of school. And, uh, you know, they were extremely happy to sell it for that. Now, if you're in a really big gallery and only selling for $500 and you have other artists who are selling for $100,000, of course, they're going to put all their efforts into selling all the other paintings. You're going to be very last person. Oh, if this person just absolutely does not have any money, okay, fine, we'll take them to see your work. So if you find a gallery where your $500 painting is a good sale for them and they like your work, they'll sell it. It's better to do that than to try to think... People, too many artists think that the gallery is going to make them, but it's not true. Your work, so you find the place, and even if it's the best gallery in the world, if you can just sense from the gallery owner that they really aren't really that excited about your paintings, that's going to show through in the collectors uh, when they come in. And so that's really the best clue to see, do they really like my work? Are they excited about it? And if it's just a frame shop, go with it, because they'll still be able to sell it. Right, and I think with the internet nowadays, you can really put your own artwork out, whereas mm -hmm. when we started, there wasn't the internet, so you had magazine articles. Right. But we also had a lot of problems with galleries who were like the best gallery in that town. And, you know, we would walk in, and they would just be so snooty to us, meaning, you know, like... Not it, knowing that we were artists. Well, first of all, maybe not knowing who you are, and even when they find out, just... The, their personality, if they're too up t mean or uptight, it's just going to be exactly how they sell your work or how they treat people as a collector. And we would go in, and usually it was mainly Scott, you know, I, I started off pretty small. We would go in and take our paintings off the wall in front of them. We'd walk in, and if they were not nice to us, we would just go, and we'd walk out the door, and we would go find a gallery down the street because... You know, if your work is good enough, galleries will want it. So I think that nowadays, artists have, a, it's in the artist's hands. You know, like a buyer's seller, um, meaning like a selling your house. Is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? I personally think it's an artist's market. We have more power than galleries have right now. And so you were talking at that moment about, about internet, but I guess you're not the same the same way into into the internet and social media i guess you don't have an instagram or <laughs> but is there a reason you don't have an instagram i don't or? have instagram well sue's i think i have an instagram but i've never actually looked at it or seen it but sue's posted a couple things for me I you'll think. get to it sooner or later oh yeah okay you cool. know he fights everything and then once he gets into it it's like Facebook, and now you're really into Facebook, so you'll post your paintings on Facebook. I post them on Facebook, that's about all I do. But and then I also will post things on politics and religion and get people into... It's funny to, for me to see 
I like the discussions, so I'll have some, so maybe two or three times a year I'll post a, a discussion. That is really the only more. time I'm actually really, more, oh, Sue says more, maybe more. Three times. And I'll, uh, I'll get into these long discussions. And it's interesting because you get people from all over the world writing. You can write longer things. I mean, sometimes they'll go to 400, four or 500 posts, people, very thoughtful things. And so that, that's probably what I like Facebook for more than anything. But I will post paintings and things too. Um, but I love seeing on Facebook when I post one of these political or religious debates, uh, you see the numbers, you'll be like, you'll be like at like 10,000 or 11,000 uh, um, followers. And then as I post that, you'll see the followers go down and down, you'll lose followers. And then when I post a painting, they'll go, they'll go way up, you'll gain followers. So it's kind of, but I love it because of the fact that Facebook is international. So for example, when I posted things about religion, uh, it's been really interesting because you have people who are of all different religions posting and I always make sure to keep it respectful and if somebody gets um, insulting to other people I'll give them a warning and if not then they'll get kicked off which doesn't usually happen but most people keep it very respectful and I've gotten separate emails from people or Facebook messages but usually it's an email from people in other countries especially uh, Islamic countries who will say, oh, I just wanted to let you know, it's amazing to watch, to, to, have, to, to have this, to see this discussion, how you were discussing this, you know, you are an atheist, and you're talking with people who are Christians, and who are Hindus, and who are Muslims, and who are all these different faiths, and you're all friends, and at the end, everybody's like, oh, and by the way, we love your paintings, and hope we go on another painting trip together. And so, to them, that's amazing. And they'll actually say, you know, in my country, it's actually illegal for me to be, uh, it would be considered apostasy. And it's, it's, it can go to jail for, for that. He said, so just so you know, this is who I am on Facebook when I'm having this discussion, uh, because I have a fake account and email address so that I can go on Facebook and not actually get arrested. So it makes you think, wow, that's amazing that we can do this in our country. And uh, it's fun, and I always learn things from those discussions. So that's kind of what I like Facebook for most. Um, but it's uh, um, Sue's much better at those things as far as promoting art and and, mm -hmm. and having um, having this discourse. I think of it more as a business tool for sure to post things about what we're doing, promoting a workshop or promoting a show. So. Yeah. I don't post uh, personal <laughs> rants. <laughs> no, that's I call fine. them discussions, but rants okay. will work too. <laughs> yeah. And as, as users, as viewers, how do you find the internet? Too much information because people, some people find it overwhelming that you get intoxicated. Yeah. Like too much info, too much, uh, too much images, too mm -hmm. much everything. So. You, it's hard yeah. to focus, it's hard to, to have your own ideas. Well, how do you find it as viewers, as users? Oh yeah, I take breaks. I will take a sabbatical from Facebook a lot. Um, it's interesting, I talk with my girlfriends all the time how we get influenced by it. We start to see how watching all these images affects our emotions. And it's interesting how if we see someone's successes or this or that, how we start to like Oh, they're so successful. Oh my gosh, what's, nothing is happening for me. And oh, I, you know, I must be such a loser. And that's true. Most of the things you post on Facebook or Instagram are highlights. And everything seems so magical. You don't post the days you're sick in bed or you don't post the days you're crying because um, your painting isn't working out. And that's a tricky thing. And I, I, you know, I talk a lot with my friends. We discuss it all the time because we think of it as a journey about self-discovery. Like, well, why is this triggering me? Why do I feel bad about myself today? Okay, I want other people to succeed. <laughs> why am I wishing they didn't? Or, you know, like, and um, whereas I don't know if men, I don't know, or if Scott even, that even occurs to you at all. Like, why do images or other people's posts might affect you? Um, but it does. I think maybe highly sensitive people are like, it affects me, and I have to watch that. Um, and so how I counteract that is I try to be very um, supportive of others. So I will be very conscious to comment or to like or to cheer people on because I know that how good it feels when people do that for me. 
And sometimes I'm completely overwhelmed with how nice people are. And I think, wow, I don't deserve this. And so it's a tricky thing about, and women in general have a hard time posting images of themselves. I know that sounds weird, but it, I actually have been told don't post images of yourself because people won't like it. Um, you should only post images of your paintings. And so that's a tricky balance, like, oh. And then you start, it's, so it's a weird thing about being self-promotional. How much, is it good, is it bad, are you overdoing it? So I take breaks, you know, I, like I'll be posting a lot this week, right? We're here and people, I think, want to see it. Just like I would love to see my friends on their trips. But there's always a group of people that will think you are um, being too promoting yourself. You know, you're being too uh, vain. And um, I get sometimes comments like, uh, you know, I'm jealous or wish I could do that or you're so lucky or, you know, stuff like that. And you start to realize I don't want anyone to feel bad. And um, I don't even know if those thoughts go in your head. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't scroll much on Facebook, so I, I'll check out some of my friends' things and things and like and comment mm -hmm. on them, and occasionally things will pop up that I'll see, but I'm not a big, um, I'm not a big like, looking through Facebook sort of a person. Um, I tend to uh, look at the, the discussions that I have or a few people mm -hmm. that I look at, and um, or somebody or Sue will tell me, oh, look at this artist, and I'll look up their name or something. So if like you that. see somebody posting, I sold every painting in my show. I'm so wonderful. Yay, thank you. you That's know. what I mean, is I, I probably don't come across that as much as you because I don't, you just don't pay scroll attention. as much uh, on it. So for me, the internet, I, 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 I really like the internet. I spend a, a lot of time on the internet. I mean, I'll read the New York Times in the morning and I'll read. I'll go on the BBC's website and the Guardian, and um, and then I go on a lot of science uh, uh, websites to read any of the new things or archaeology history. Um, but I use it a, quite a bit for research, whatever I'm writing at the time. So I, I love to research all of these things. So you can go on, um, you know, Wikipedia is a good starting point, and then I'll go on to other things and read about it, and then I'll get a book on tape and listen to it while I paint. So I listen to books on tape all day while I paint, or podcasts. Um, so that tends to be more the way I use the internet. I, I only have a few sites that I really click on to. So you compartmentalize. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not as, uh, same with art magazines. You're more head, I just don't even look at them and yet. I'm more heart. Yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. No, so. that's a good combination. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. It's just yeah. true, if we were both heart, we'd, yeah, we'd never get anything done. <laughs> right. But it's actually good. you do many more things. I mean, you, you do write, mm -hmm. uh, I guess you're, you're, a lot, you're very interested into science. I guess you have a routine of waking up very early and writing. I tend to write early when I'm working on a project, yeah. How, how would you, which connection do you see between all of those creative processes of writing, painting, yeah. and other stuff you might make? You find them similar or? Yeah, they feel very similar. When I'm excited about writing something or even when I'm editing a, a film or something that I've filmed, um, it's just, it's very exciting. The creative juices are flowing and everything. Um, it's just very similar. And writing is very similar to painting in that, you know, you start out with your first draft, you have all these ideas, and then it's about trying to say the same thing in fewer words. So you usually it goes to from whatever length I have my first draft, it usually ends up about half that at the end. So you go through, cut things out, but each paragraph you'll say, okay, there's five sentences here. How can I say the same thing in three sentences? And it's usually much better. It's like what, um, but in paintings it's the same way. Oftentimes as I'm painting, you know, you're painting things and then as you get halfway, a lot of it is about saying, okay, I, how can I make the focus more on this? So I'm gonna lose things, I'm gonna simplify areas. So usually what I take out and don't show is probably the biggest thing in a painting. And it's similar in writing, where you're taking things out, or even when you're editing a film, a documentary, it's like you think, okay, what do I really need? What can I cut this earlier? What part, you know, do I need, can I start sooner? And so that's similar. Now the differences are that 
each medium is better to say a particular thing. So sometimes I have an idea of something that I would like to portray and it works better visually. And then other times it works better in words because you can really go through you know, a philosophical idea or something. And so they, um, so usually it, it's kind of just like a different medium and you decide what, what you're excited about right now at the time, trying to try to convey whether you've been on a trip or whatever. So uh, writing a, like a novel, the two novels that I've written, the differences with those are that they are very long-term project, much longer. And I think the longest I've spent on a big painting is like three months. Whereas the, the writing, um, those stories can take a couple years, you know, to, to, to write. And so you have to get into a routine of, for me, it's usually getting up in the mornings and writing a few hours. And then there's times when I'm really into it and I'll just be writing all day for weeks or months and not doing anything else. But the routine is what really matters. Just doing a little bit every day, even if it ends up in a week, you, that part was all just thrown out. You have to be in that routine of just doing it and doing it. And it is a very long-term process. But it's, it's learning. It's like going to a class. Uh, the film I made on separation of church and state, and I traveled around and interviewed you know, the experts in this field um, at, in, you know, at Jefferson's house and in Washington, D.C., and all these things. It was like taking a course. I mean, in fact, our uh, professor who te teaches at Wake Forest asked me to go with them to Washington and speak to his, his class um, because you'd learn so much about the subject. So it's, it's just all the research and talking to people and then interviewing people on the different sides. It's the same with writing a novel, you know, all the research. And in your own mind, I'll have two different characters arguing different points of different philosophical issues. And so you might have agree with one of the characters, but then you have to really be able to make the argument for the other side as good as you can, and sometimes that ends up, re you realize, wow, some of these things that I assumed actually aren't true the same way, so it can change your opinion on things, even just by having the two characters debate and trying to, to find out the best argument, so. And that helps you, I guess, to understand your own painting, I mean, not being just a full-time painter doesn't mean that other aspects are a distraction or... Because I guess, Susan, you're a full-time painter. You, <laughs> you never wanted to write or do anything else? No, or? I have actually... I have no ability to write. And if there's anything written that is so-called from me, it comes from him. <laughs> <laughs> She'll say, I've got to write a statement for this painting. Oh get, get on it, yeah, Scott. Really. <laughs> I just... And he'll spend, like an hour on a paragraph and I feel so guilty I'm like Scott come on really and he wants to make it perfect and and he makes it sound so good and he'll use these big words and I'll read it and I'll be like I've never said that word in my life that's so wonderful people really think I'm smart and I'm like okay <laughs> there was one recently though that I remember I, I wrote something for you and you said Mm, I want more, more profound. I want, I want to sound <laughs> I, I smarter. Said, that sounded, so that's, I, that's, I, that was I, too I, lame. Add more. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be better. More, more just like, yeah, more excitement, like more pretty words. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know if uh, the writing helps my painting at all, except well, to keep me excited. Yeah, give me a break. Um, I probably would be a better painter if I only painted and didn't do the documentaries and the writing, because I would be doing it more. But I don't know if I'd be a better person. So I, my goal isn't simply to do only the best paintings possible. My goal is to learn and to be excited about life. And, and, and I do get bored, and so probably once I come back to the painting, I'm really re-energized. So I don't know if any, I pick up anything specific from writing the stories except for getting my enthusiasm back. So, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So in the end, as you said, in literature and painting, it's more about cutting than adding. It's like a, mm -hmm. going to the basics, going to... Yeah, it's like what Mark Twain said. I think he was the one who said, um, I'm, sorry, uh, I'm sorry this letter's so long, I didn't have time to make it short. You know, <laughs> which is true. It's like, you know, you, you edit things down. It, it takes time to make something short. And, uh, you know, and that's what's the beauty of it. And it's the same with painting, trying to do it in fewer strokes rather than, you know, having a little brush and doing every single little detail everywhere. Then that you haven't really made a statement, you know, you haven't decided what's important to you and trying to simplify it so the eye sees it and it's like, oh yeah, I get the idea behind that, 
you know, that visual emotion. So, so we could say maybe a, a painting too much uh, finished could ruin the style or expression. You say it that way? Yeah, I yeah. mean, our aesthetic. There's definitely people who are realistic and we appreciate them, but our aesthetic is more of a, a simplicity. I mean, mm -hmm. a, a impressionistic or realistic impressionism, is that kind of a good I word? I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think even, even the uh, very refined, very finished paintings, you know, even somebody like Bouguereau, who is very finished, you see areas in the painting that go off into the shadow and mm -hmm. go into the quiet, and he doesn't try and paint every single rock and every single ground, and then you're, you're, he still has a focus to it. So I think, uh, I think that's somewhat of a commonality in art itself, you, in writing and poetry. You need, to, you, need to have your, you need to know where you want someone to look or what, what is your point and not put in some, every single thing. I used to hear you say, talking about the bullseye. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And how would you balance, uh, I mean, because we, on one hand we would have, uh, we would have a curiosity, and the other hand, the other hand we would have an uh, expression. How do we, do you balance that? If you had to choose one, which one would you choose? I mean, a curiosity, expression, how do we balance it? Curiosity or expression? Accuracy. Accuracy. Oh, accuracy. 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 Yeah. accuracy. <laughs> well, I mean, you want both. I mean, that's the goal. I mean, I think that's what we're teaching in this class. I'm stressing accuracy and telling them once they it becomes second nature, then you can be a little looser. Um, but people don't realize that they have to have that in their brain already, so they know what's important. Um, a lot of times, when you're doing a gesture or a quick sketch especially when I'm doing figures, like a nude, in like 45 minutes, there's no way I can get everything. It's, so you train yourself to know what's important. If you have to put lots of colors and just three sharp edges, what three? And that's where you figure out what's important. So you have left so much out, but those three shape, those three lines have to be accurate to show you that it's a figure, the rest of it can be magic and left alone. Um, so, I, I mean, I do think, especially when we're painting figures, I mean, I don't know about like landscapes, because you can be very um, imaginative with landscapes and you can create a world of your own that doesn't have to exist anywhere. But if you're gonna paint a human, I think it otherwise just feels so uncomfortable if, it, if there's not accuracy there. What yeah, I mean, I, I see sometimes I see paintings that are super creative and interesting, but not really that well painted or drawn. And they can still be really interesting paintings, you know, that you like. Um, and you, you, you kind of think, God, I wish they would have gotten this a little bit better. It would be a better painting. Mm -hmm. But they're still creative enough that they can carry their own. And I see the flip side. I'll see paintings that are just so technically beautifully done. It's just amazingly beautifully painted and the, the colors and the edges and everything. But then sometimes you look at the subject of those, some of those paintings and you think, well, you put all this time and effort into this and you chose that to paint, you know? <laughs> you're just like, you know, I so said you're kind of curious. So sometimes it is just so beautifully painted that that could still overcome it. Uh, the true magic is when you have both, you know, when they both come together and it's a rare thing for it to happen. It's the same thing in writing and film. I mean, there's stories that are so, the story itself is just so interesting and compelling. Uh, it could be the person's story themselves or whatever. And you read it and you just think, you kind of cringe at some of the, some of the awkward and you have to read a sentence or two a couple times to even understand what they mean, you know. But the story is still so compelling that you can get over that. And then there's other things that are maybe not all that interesting of a story, compelling, but they're so beautifully written, just the words themselves. But then when you combine the two, that's when you get your masterpieces. You know, you get things that are incredible stress. When you get Shakespeare absolute beautiful on the language. To me, those are the technical level and then the emotional level and the story level. The two of them together are what, what we're, we're, we're shooting for. Um, so it's not one or the other, uh, but you know, uh, some, not everybody has, 
you know, every painting is perfect on both, both ends. If you have neither, then you really have a problem, you know. Expressing and just expressing couldn't hold a painting, couldn't make it work, just right. being expressive. Some people say that sometimes uh, find certain painters too prostrocky mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and uh, is there a moment, a point from which uh, prostroke might become a bit egocentric, like showing off or... Yeah. Absolutely. That balance is so hard to find. I mean, every painting you're going through that, you're, you're, trying to make, you're trying to make it work on both levels. You're trying to make it work on the abstract level and on the realistic level. What I'm portraying has to be interesting, and then the strokes themselves have to be interesting. But don't and you think sometimes technique yeah, overtakes? It, it can overtake to where you're just, you're only concentrating on that, and so, the, so it's hard to even think about the actual subject. So that balance... It's like every painting I'll go and I'll think, okay, well, I've, I've got it right, I've got the, you know, the expression right and everything, but it's so boringly painted, you know, that I'll have to repaint it and repaint it, and then I get too over the top. Okay, that's too flashy, too technique-y. So it has to be, that balance is very hard, and it's different for different paintings and different painters. Um, you think of like Van Gogh versus, you know, uh, Bouguereau uh, or something where, you know, they both work and they have their different balance. Um, one has more... Uh, emphasis on one or the other, the subject matter versus the the technique, you know. So it's it's hard to do, it's hard to define. Well, yeah, we're so. talking about two big ones. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. think what's important between Scott and me, especially when we teach, and I've heard, I think you've heard me say this over and over again, is we don't want our students to paint like us. Right. Um, whereas a lot of teachers have a certain technique or a certain style and the students take those teachers because they want their paintings to look just like that. So then you see the stu you know, you see the copycats almost like, wow, there's the original artist and then everybody else is just doing their exact technique. And I understand that happens in the beginning. We all did that. Like we all see certain artists and we want to, we want to figure out how do they do that brushstroke and so I want to do that brushstroke and but it's very tricky then for you to start trying to sell that because um, it's okay to almost learn it and you have to go through that but I don't want people to so-called draw or paint like me I want just them to think in the light and value and just I mean, teach them who they are and you're the same way I mean yeah hopefully they'll take a little bit from you mm -hmm. a little bit from this artist a little bit from that artist and they'll build their own kind of style mm -hmm. you know actually being very different as uh, painters mm -hmm. your process or a stitchers is quite similar your approaches right is very uh, similar yeah and even though the paintings themselves look very different we're using those basics which everybody uses no matter what medium or whatever you use. So. Yeah, it's trying to find the right words. Um, especially teaching over in Europe, too. Like, some of the ladies have never heard the word squint, and some of the ladies have never heard certain tech ideas, and we forget, you know, we take things for granted. The same thought process, the same words we use, and so sometimes we even hear artists will say a word for something and we're like, what does that mean? Right. Because they went to a different school or they went to, a, if they're part of a different group. And um, so I'm always trying to find the right language so that it's communal, so that everyone understands what I'm talking about. Because, you know, it, we, we all use different um, words and that can be difficult to, you know, yeah. be so basic about it. But Well, one thing uh, with training, workshops and knowledge about painting anatomical structure and that is the, the how difficult might it be to balance what you know and what you see how's that in your case how do you balance what you know and what you see do you want to take it or well i guess i don't think either of us really studied anatomy but i in class what i'm trying to tell people is that for us we only want to think about the light and how it hits the object. I never want to think that I'm painting a lip or painting a nose or an eye because then our brain tricks us and people start just thinking about what an eye looks like. And a good, ex a good trick is to turn your image upside down or turn your painting upside down because then we start seeing things abstractly and the part of our brain that wants to be literal can relax. 
it's, you know, a lot of times I'm always telling people to simplify the shapes and paint through areas and they get really hung up because they see so much information in here and they need to put everything and line it up and I'm like, no, no, mystery, paint through it and that's a very difficult idea to a concept to understand in the beginning. Once you it clicks on, it's magic and you want to do that everywhere, but until it clicks, you fight it, you fight it, you fight it because you see edges, because you see an ear before hair or an apple next to something, you want to paint the object and not the light hitting it. So I since I don't know anatomy well enough to understand what's happening underneath, I just try my hardest to really compare shapes next to each other and I think everything is a puzzle piece. Everything has a positive and a negative shape next to each other. Um, how would you explain it? Yeah, I, uh, I did go through a year when I was at the Academy in life drawing where I did get anatomy books and draw them all and actually made flashcards and memorized the muscles and, 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 and things like that. Um, but, and I know some artists who are very into anatomy and you see it in their paintings and they do absolutely beautiful uh, action poses and they're, they're emphasizing even muscles that they don't see and everything. And I can see where that would be very helpful or if you're a sculptor that could be very helpful working three dimensionally. Um, but for me, just like Sue said, uh, it was, it, you know, historically it was a bit of an advance when people started to actually stop thinking about trying to paint something anatomically and knowing what they're painting and to go to this idea of which which goes you goes through Vermeer and Franz Halls and and um, Velasquez. Carlos Ter Velasquez and uh, and and Sargent their Sargent was it was very much into that just saying he does not want to actually know think about what he's painting you know aesthetically when you set up the model and decide what your focus is you can but to really just and it's a very difficult thing to do, what we've been teaching the class here. That's always the hardest thing, uh, uh, what you know. And that happens especially when you're doing like a three-quarter and your brain is trying to actually show the full side of the face. Or when the quarter of the eye actually disappears behind the nose. People will move it over and try and paint that corner of the eye and what they know an eye looks like. And so that's, that's the most difficult thing to turn off in your brain. And, and so that took us years to, of practicing to actually look at something, you know, squint down and just look at the shape. Look at the shape. Look at this shape. And so if you get accurately each shape next to each other with the edges, it will turn into a face. So when I paint a person, I, and I'm actually in the painting of it, and it's beyond setting it up and the aesthetic of it, that's really how I try and think, whether I'm doing a landscape or a person. Doing a landscape, I know I don't have to be as, as picky on the drawing. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of our way of, of painting that goes through that tradition of artists. And there's a whole other tradition of artists who are painting anatomically. And you see it, the difference in their work, because they're actually trying to see things that aren't actually there. But we're just trying to say, okay, I like the way this looks under this lighting, and so if I can just copy these things and simplify the things I'm not interested in, and then sometimes you come back from that and you think about the model and you think about the expression. Am I, you know, do I want to slightly change this or that to, to, to you know, get the character that I want or the expression. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much how we try to actually forget about what we know. Yeah, we see that your approach is very similar in that way when you're teaching. Yeah. And another thing that happens a lot with the students is that they, is that they get talk, they get blog, they don't, they hate what they're doing. Maybe they're not aware that this happens to every artist, doesn't it? And I'm talking mm -hmm. about your, your case. And how do yeah. you overcome this, the situations when you're blocked and you're stuck, when you hate what you're doing, you mm -hmm. see something's not working. How do you overcome all of this and stand up again? You go first. Okay. Um, well, uh, you know, it, it, it is kind of the definition of insanity where, where, you know, I start every painting. I'm so excited, you know, I'm really just so excited to do this painting. I know it's going to be the best painting I've done ever. Um, you have delus you know, delusions of, oh my God, this is going to just be incredible. And then as you paint it, there's a certain point you get where you realize it's actually not going to be as good as I had hoped for, I had in my mind. 
And uh, then it's about trying to get it as good as you can, you know, and you, you get it. And then by the end of the painting, I'm usually always very down about the painting. The same thing happens to me when I write a novel as well. When I finish it, you know, it's not lived up to, to, to what I had hoped for. And so then you get really frustrated, and really you just have to start another one. I, I will analyze it and think, what could be better? That's, that's probably the best thing, is to be specific. When you have a failure, or even when you have a painting that's come out fairly well, but you're still disappointed in it, be specific. Take some time off, and then come back at it and look at it with a very rational eye, and just try and think about, okay, if I were to do this over, and where I do my next painting, what are the specific things that I need to work on? that need to be better. Sometimes it can help you to put it, to have a book of an of a, of a artist that you admire, a professional artist. I used, and when I was in art school, I used to take my drawing or painting and I would put it next to it at the end of class, the best artist in the class. Because we're working from the same model, it was similar. Because I would know when I go over to their painting, this is fantastic. And then when I go to mine, I'm, it's not fantastic, but I couldn't quite know why is this so different than theirs. When I put them right next to each other, it would like, immediately you'd see, oh, my edges are all too hard, or I just try to do, my shadows aren't dark enough, or whatever it is, or my drawing is certainly weak. It was very obvious. So you can do the same thing by taking a book of an artist that has done something that you admire that's similar to the subject that you've done. If you stand back and hold it so the book is about the same height as what you're seeing, things will just jump out at you. But overall, it's just, continue to work, you know, continue to try to get better. So I'll start the new painting, determine it's going to be the best painting ever, then it's not and I'm down. And then it's amazing how somehow I can still believe in the next painting <laughs> that this is going to be the best painting ever. That's why I say it's like the definition of insanity, you know, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. But the, the good news is, is that when you look back over your work over many years, you start to see, oh yeah, well, I'm still down about this, but I am improving. I've improved a lot since then. And so hopefully that will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, for me too, I, I get frustrated a lot, but I think getting critiqued by friends helps because, you know, when you're staring at something so long, you lose perspective. And all you see are the mistakes. Like you assume everyone can read your mind and we'll zero in on that. And nobody even sees that. And so I, I, it's great for me to have friends that, you know, I get critiques from. And Scott and I work a little differently where when he works on a painting, he will work on it from finish to end. He'll never take a break. You rarely ever go back. I mean, maybe twice in your whole life will you ever go back to a painting, fix it, and you know, finish it. For me, that is everything I do. I love starting paintings, right? I love the beginning, it's, there's possibility. Um, and as I paint, I'm fixing, I'm changing, I'm trying to make it better. And about 80% through a painting, I personally have to stop and I put it against the wall because I need a break from it. And then I'll start something new. And so I will have lots of paintings in progress. Um, and then when I haven't, haven't looked at that painting for a long time, I'll look at it again and it's fresh again. I'm like, oh, okay, and then I'll finish it. So I have lots of things in different degrees of um, finish and that's the only way I can finish things because I get to the point, like, you know, to 10, 15, 20% almost done. Maybe I get scared, maybe I'm sick of looking at it. I need to see it fresh. And, but Scott isn't like that. You just, you need to finish it um, or else you Once know. I'll lose my, in, in my, yeah. my, my forward momentum, mm -hmm. and if I set a thing aside, generally then I've never come back to it. So I've got to yeah. either, it'll either fail or it'll succeed. There's occasionally I've come back to ones but, um, and, and repainted them and got them to work, but mostly Sue's right. When I have that excitement, I've got to keep it going uh, and I'll redo things, I'll repaint things over and over and over. The one I'm working on at home, I repainted the face like four or five times. And um, so I'll do that, but yeah, yeah mm -hmm. we're definitely different in that way. And uh, those moments in which you need a piece of advice, who do you talk to? Well, I pretty much just ask Sue. Uh, when I, especially when I get to the end of the painting, I'll, I want a fresh eye. 
And she'll usually see, oh, I'm sorry. And she's so nice because she knows it's like struggle with this thing. She's like, your, your eye is a little too high or this or that or whatever it is in the painting. And she's really, mostly, I always agree. There's sometimes that it's more aesthetic and I, 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 I won't agree and I won't do it. Um, but most of the time, she'll totally have it and, and then I'll see it. Um, but I, yeah, I don't really, there's no really anybody else. You don't have I, anybody else. And I only really see it at the end. Yeah. Um, like I said, because we paint it separately. Um, but we all have habits and tendencies. Even people might think Scott never, ever makes a mistake. He has a tendency sometimes to make yeah. the alignment off. And it's because we're trying to make everything so perfect, we're not stepping back a lot. So when I just walk in, I'm like, oh, it's just a little bit high. You know? I struggle with that so and much. And then it's like he lowers it, and it's perfect. Yeah. But... Yeah, and in general, Scott doesn't see my work until he takes a photo. He, he does all our photography and takes photos of it. Sometimes I'll ask him you know, advice about something, but usually the funny thing you say, I'm nice, I, I actually critique. He's so nice, everything I do is great. No. And this is true. You always say everything is great. So I have girlfriends. Everything is great, but, okay. but I will give her advice. Every, well, but in general, you always say, oh, I wouldn't touch anything. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> But I do have girlfriends that I share a studio with, and even though we don't paint similarly, we all kind of paint people, but oh my gosh, it's a gift to have someone critique you. I think it is the greatest gift. I actually get really um, teared up because they want me to succeed. So there's no jealousy or this or that. And when somebody helps me and they help my painting get better because they've seen it and they help me do something, i just like, oh my God. I, and so I help them and we help each other. And um, I, I'm very grateful that we don't have a um, competitiveness um, because I can imagine that if you were in art school or that you were painting around people and somebody's getting a lot of attention Somebody's getting all the accolades. Somebody's the hot shot. You know, I, you know, it's human nature, you know, to be like, oh, you know, I, I'm not as good or this or that. And it's just nice. I can see there can be competitiveness because it urges you. Like Scott said that when he was in school, you know, all these good people were coming up together. Oh my God, that person did a great painting. That person did a great painting. It forced you, your level, to go up. But sometimes, you know, it could be a little awkward if somebody gets in a really bad mood because they usually are the best and somebody else is best. It's just, then you have tension. And I just think it's so nice to support, to have somebody to feel confident enough. So my friends are confident enough in themselves and they care enough about me so that they're like, we want you to succeed, and I'm like, thank you, and I want you to succeed, I want you to do your best, and, um, and that's just, that's an interesting dilemma, it's human nature. Um, do you help your fellow neighbor, you know, maybe even do better than you? So that's a curious thing, but I always have my friends critique my work and give me advice. Yeah, I don't see art as competitive. I never have been. I've been always wanting to push myself. And when I see somebody do really good, it makes me excited. I'm like, oh, I want to learn that too. But I really don't like uh, shows that have these really competitive awards where everybody wants to win. I mean, we're in them, and sometimes you win, and sometimes, sometimes you feel more embarrassed when you win. You're just like, oh my God, there's so, you know, it's so, so many better things. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't really like the whole thing about making art into competition which is a, a, a big trend and people love competition. So it's like a sport or whatever, but I don't really see art that way. And um, I think, you know, there doesn't have to be a one winner, you know, and, it, and it's just all relative too, to who's judging it. And, and I think it creates um, bad feelings between people when everybody's going for this one award and uh, when someone wins it, then, you know, everybody else feels disappointed. So like some of the shows, like when we, I used to do Plein Air Painters of America for years, and we had no awards. It was great. People just would, we would get together for two weeks uh, in Catalina Island. We would all paint outdoors for two weeks, then we'd have a big show, and it was a super popular, successful show. It's a show that really kicked off the whole Plein Air uh, movement in the country. And, um, 
but it was just everybody was such good friends and things. And so there's other plein air shows which are all based on some giant award that they could win. And so I think it changes the whole tone. Not only that, because it's a competition, then people have to get their canvases stamped to prove that they did it that week or whatever. And I just don't think that art should be a competition because once everybody is, you know, they're expressing different things. There's no way to really compare one person to the other. I mean, you see things that you think, oh, those are great, you know, and, and, and you know who's done a good job and who hasn't. Um, you don't need a judge to tell you, and half the time the judge doesn't even really get it right, you know, which was, you know, and, uh, and so when you win an award and you really weren't the best, I mean, you know, I'll feel embarrassed, you know, and, uh, you know, so, so yeah, so the whole competition thing, it can be good to be competitive as far as with yourself, and I think it is good to have a group of people who are, because it pushes you, certainly at the palette and chisel, we would go to school all day and then go to the palette and chisel at night and paint, there on the weekends, um, without that group, there's no way I would have gone every single night or every single weekend. But oh man, you don't want to miss out. And each people are so you're feeding off the energy and pushing each other. So that's good thing about being in a group of artists as opposed to just doing it on your own. Um, it pushes you, but it doesn't push you to like crush the competition. You know, <laughs> it pushes you to all get there together. It's exciting. Yeah. And we can also see uh, from you as teachers that you share a lot, how many, there's no secrets to keep, you share a lot with your students, like sharing is a good thing. So, for instance, tell us about the one of, uh, one interesting thing you've lately realized or found, something interesting that you've recently found. Oh my gosh, you mean in painting? Oh, whatever. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's profound. Um, oh! <laughs> All right, will you go first? One interesting thing yeah. recently. Well, recently, I, I've, you know, you, you kind of feel like you've learned something. You know, they, they tell you the basic. In fact, our teacher in school, at my life drawing teacher, I started in high school, started to take classes in junior and senior year high school life drawing, and then I went there full time on a scholarship. My, our teacher would say, you know, I'm going to tell you everything you're going to ever need to know about drawing um, this first day. You know, how to, how to measure, squinting and comparing, how to do edges and things like this. And yet it's going to take your whole life to learn them. And so oftentimes you, you feel like, oh, I've learned these lessons. And then all of a sudden you realize there's a whole deeper level to learn. them. So recently I've been really getting into embracing soft. <laughs> so, I mean, I love thick paint and everything. And so I, I, I've... You know, explored that for a long time, and I've always had trouble with soft edges, but I've really gotten into certain techniques for, and so it's been a, a new way that I've been working on my studio paintings, where I've been blocking everything in thick the way I normally do, and then I've been um, letting that set up overnight, and then I come back and I use this like kind of soft, roundish brush, and I soften up a lot of the painting. And then I repaint it. It's a little tacky. I can work into it. And then I repaint it, and I get certain areas thicker and stuff. So that's been the new revelation to me of, of how important. In fact, I would see it in paintings. You go things, and you some of the paintings that I admire so much, I see, well, you know, you're, my eye goes to these bold strokes, you know, that he has here or there. But if you actually think about it, before those bold strokes were put in, boy, everything is actually really, like almost classy, you know, and then they, these bold strokes look even better. So that's been the big revelation for me lately. Um, and it's something, of course, that I was told in the very beginning, that first day of class, you know, with edges and stuff. And yet I've really been getting into it lately. Probably for you, it's been experimenting with your pastels. Yeah, using mixed media, getting more experimental with not just using oil paint. But I guess the one thing I would like to say to that question is something that maybe at my age right now, it's sort of like a midlife thing. Um, when I was young, when I was in art school, I was incredibly intimidated. I hindered my growth because of my fear and um, because everybody's better than me. Oh, I could never be that good. I'm just going to live in Scott's shadow and, and support him. And um, it stunted me. For years, I mean, people don't people don't believe it. They think, "What are you talking about? 
you know, we've heard about you forever, or this or that. And I'm like, if you only knew that I, one of my best friends had to force me to go out and teach, and I told her she had to hold my hand. And um, I mean, it almost makes me emotional because my revelation now is that, you know, we just had a few young girls, because I think women in general have this problem, but a few young girls we invited to our house over the summer because I see in them courage and bravery and strength that I did not have at 19 and 20. And because when I was that age, I just started painting. And if anybody came around to see my work, I'd put a sheet of paper over it. And I would start crying and I would run out of the room. And because I didn't have the confidence, and I'm only bringing this up because I think that, so my idea now is to give to people what I wish I would have got. I wish I would have had somebody mentor me and tell me it's going to be okay and show me the way and not be so fearful. And, you know, and also attitude goes a long way. I've learned from teaching these workshops that the people with the most positive outlook, the most open, receptive, welcoming, you know, wanting advice and going with the flow. I mean, it's a spiritual lesson, but that kind of works with everything. And yeah, we would see people who write, they want so bad, they're upset, which is where I was. And you would judge your stuff too much. You'd wash it off and you would get all heated up and, you know, it, it stunts, it puts walls in your way. And I remember vividly, te we were teaching a workshop one day and we had a nude figure in the model and we had a light above and we had 20 students. So of course, it's hard to get a great pose for 20 students with one model, but we tried our hardest and it looked good from 18 spots. <laughs> two spots were like, oh, geez. And I remember coming up to these two ladies and saying, I'm so sorry that you have the spot, but tomorrow you'll get a better spot. And you know, and I just really apologize that and if it was me, I would have been like, oh God, this spot. And I probably internally would have been really mad. And it, all the thoughts going through my brain, why did I get this spot? And this is horrible. And I just want to leave. Well, those two ladies did the best paintings in the class. I, was, I made everybody stop and come over and say, look at this. Would any of you chosen to sit here? No, we would have all been like, we're victims. We need to leave. We're upset. And it was because of their attitude, because they were so happy to be in class, because they just wanted to do art, and because they were so open to the experience and they weren't going to complain, that they, their joy showed through in their paintings. And everyone came over and said, oh my god, those are beautiful. And it's a lesson. It, and I'm just saying that because that's a lesson that I learned over and over again, not to put roadblocks in front of me and not to like have all the thoughts in my head about fear and not living up to things and not being good enough. Um, you know, to let that go. So it's not so much technical, it's, it's more of a, an emotional thing. And um... That's a good answer. And it is true with teaching. I mean, everything that we teach and that we know are things that were shared with us. I mean, nobody, even if you're self-taught, you learn things through books, you see things, you know, from other artists and stuff. Uh, all of these things are, you know, you're not going to come across them on your own. I and mean, you see the history of art and how some one little thing in perspective or the way to look at, you know, color and impressionistically or, or, or these techniques, they all were like little advances that then spread through everybody. And so uh, it is fun. It's kind of addictive to share it. I, 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 I remember one time, this is an extreme example of it, but we, you see this all the time. And, and I am definitely a, dick, a type of person who loves to teach someone something, whether it's painting or pointing out something about history or whatever it is to them. It's very so in my books, it's similar to that. But I remember we at Kettle, at uh, Laguna Beach at the planner show that we used to do there at the museum. They would have us do a quick draw after the week of painting out in the Heisler Park and all the artists would paint there so that the public could come and the Los Angeles Times and all this stuff would cover it. And But then after that was my favorite part where they would have 50 kids who would come to the park who had been chosen from different schools all through Los Angeles They'd, and um, they were all different ages, you know, from grade schools. 
and uh, they would be given a whole set of paints and easels and all this stuff that they could then use on their own. And you were allowed to, and I always did volunteer, to teach the kids as they were, you know, to do their first plein air painting. And I remember the one time when I had this little girl, and um, she wanted, her mother had brought her and had their little dog, which was like a brown little Datsun type thing with a purple collar. And she wanted to paint that. I was like, oh, great, we'll paint that. You know, I'll help you with that. And she's like, but they only gave us blue, red, yellow, and white. You know, I can't, he's brown. He has a purple collar. It's green grass he's sitting on. I don't have those colors. I was like, oh, okay. And you realize she'd only drawn before. And so I would say, okay, mix the blue, mix the yellow. And then her eyes just were like, whoa, it was like a Harry Potter spell, you know, it changed color right in front of her. And she's like, well, what about purple, you know? She said, and she was like really skeptical when she got those and she's like, yeah, but brown, I mean, you know, how are you gonna get that out of these colors? These are bright colors, you know? And so that moment of, um, of, uh, of seeing something new, I remember it. In fact, when, when I'm teaching, so many times when I'm showing somebody something, uh, something new and, and you see that light go off I remember the moment when I learned all these things and usually it was from another student you know who was pointing out to me how you mix colors and put little spots of color so that they start to think and uh, it, it's interesting because I remember them so clearly you know the moment I learned those things and it's, it's really fun to see it go off in someone else's eyes yeah, that's a sweet story about yeah, that, I know. and uh, on the other hand is there something you used to believe in that you no longer believe in? With painting or just in life <laughs> in general? Not general? Well, I'm not as ambitious as I used to be. I think, you know, when you first get into art, you get influenced. You just, you know, it's just, oh my gosh, you want to be important, right? You want, you, you know, you want to be like famous or, I mean, in general, you know, like you see other people and you were like, I want that. And as I get older, I just realize that it's, I don't want that. I, so I don't have those goals of um, being in certain shows or, you know, or doing certain things. I just, um, being happy with what you have and these small little joys of, I think workshops are um, a great way of just like sharing information and we get so much out of it. Like I come home more inspired uh, I mean, I, my energy level goes up as the week, you know, goes on and I don't want anyone to leave. I like, I fall in love with people and I don't want them to go. And I feel like now we're besties and um, I feed off that as like an extrovert. Um, so th those small experiences are enough for me. Like I don't need to be like rich or famous or, you know, that type of thing. Cause I just don't think it probably lives up to what I used to think it was or that energy of wanting so much, needing so much um, what you don't have. What about you? I mean, there's so many things that, if I think of myself like in high school and grade school, so many things that I thought were certainties that I now don't believe in. I mean, I went through religion, I was very religious and lost that. There's so many different things. I mean, I was very isolated growing up in my neighborhood, you know, and so, um, you know, I mean, I used to think that gay people were just all crazy people, you know. I'm sure I'd met a gay person, but that was just assumed. We all knew. As soon as I went to the academy and met my first gay person, I was like, wow, that's all not true. That's completely nonsense. You know what I, what I just, you just assume these things that you grow up with. So that is somewhat humbling when you, you remember how you had believed so certainly about certain things, and now you don't. So it makes you realize okay, I've changed my mind once, I may change my mind again, so you're very open to things. But as far as changing my mind uh, towards things with art, I would say probably this happened very early on when I was in art school. Uh, when my teacher gave me really good advice on it, because I would go, when I was my first year full-time at the academy, I would go to where the third year students were. Every day I'd go to the oil painting class and see what they were doing. And that was funny, because I mean, I would go up to uh, different artists uh, like Ramel, De La Torre, and other people who were in their third year, and I would just be like, wow, that's just unbelievable, Ramel. I mean, that is so great. And he would be, he would always say, it was like the same thing every day. He'd say, gee, thanks, Scott, that means a lot coming from you. Because I'd say it every day. 
you know, every day I would be like, you know, wow. And he'd be like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm so frustrated with this or that. It's not coming out. And the other students would say that too, third year. And I'd come back to my teacher and I remember one time coming back to him and saying, I don't understand. Are these third year students that the really good ones that I admired so much, are they just like putting on like a show, you know, pretending like they're not happy or to, can they actually not see how great they are? You know, they see they're actually depressed about their paintings. I mean, if that happened to me, I would be so happy. Everything would be great. And, uh, but they must see it because they are doing it. And he'd say, you won't really understand until you're, you're in your third year. He said, but you're always gonna actually feel like that. And it was true when I got into my third year and people were coming in and were like, wow, wow. I was always just like, oh, man, what are you talking about? And I still feel the same way now. And so, you know, when you tell that to sometimes to people who are starting out, they don't believe you. They're like, are you, you're telling me you're not happy with this painting or some of your paintings? And so they don't quite understand, but that always happens. So that was a big revelation to me uh, then that you keep kind of learning. Um, it's not something that I learned early on. So, um, but that was, that was something that I really did think, you know, when I went to school, I thought if I can just learn how to paint good, you know, I'll make money, you know, because I had no money or anything, I would, my whole life will be great. And then it was interesting, you know, once I started making enough money to survive, once we were comfortable with it, I lost my motivation to make money. And, and sometimes it's frustrating because I, I really just don't care about making money. Know. You know? Like, you know? Please make you know? money. I'm like, <laughs> We've got enough. What do I need more for? I'm more interested in doing things that I'm excited about. And sometimes it's painting and sometimes it's making documentaries or writing it's novels like you tricked that make me. no money. You know? Exactly. Like I married you because you were going to be so successful. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, what happened? <laughs> I know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> It feels like we could do whatever we want, and so yeah. I, I don't really have a desire to have, yeah. like, you know... Well, it means you're not as ambitious anymore, either. It's like, I'm not ambitious yeah. in that way. I'm yeah. very ambitious about trying to improve painting and learning new things and that sort of thing, but I'm, I'm not at all motivated by money. And, you know, people mm -hmm. will come to me with things where it's like, oh, this can make tons of money, and I'm like, yeah, I just don't... I'm not interested well, in that. So. we are glad that you are also interested in experiences and experiences. Yeah. But, so... Because it's been really a pleasure oh, having yeah. you, you with us, and the students love you. <laughs> so it's really been great. And it's been really been great chatting with you right now. And yeah. So just uh, for ending, very good. How about Menorca? Did your experience with Menorca Pulsar? How's it been? Well, you know, we had no idea what to expect, but you guys have been so sweet and generous, oh and. Uh, so professional. I mean, we first saw your website and your videos, and I remember I kept showing Scott. I'm like, oh my God, these are awesome. Who are these people? How they're so professional. And um, so uh, we're just very impressed. And just not how professional you are, but you guys just seem to be so sweet. I don't know. Well, and the thing that made me laugh the most was. Uh, you know, some people would say, oh, you're going to Spain. Aren't you afraid of, of terrorists in Europe or this or that? And you're just like, I mean, we've been to Europe enough that we're, we know that's just nothing to worry about. It's so much safer here than going right. to Chicago or Los Angeles or New York. And yet uh, that perception is, is interesting because when you don't travel, I had never really been, you know, I'd never, I'd never even been on a plane until I was 21. I didn't, didn't even have a driver's license until I was 21. And so I had these fears of, of, of other places. And, but yeah, just to tell people, this is like, it's amazing coming here. Even it's so funny, you're having the, uh, the, you know, the independence, whole independence thing and stuff. And so it was interesting to be in Barcelona, but you don't see, you see, you might see on the news, you know, big rallies, but unless you actually go there, you, it's just like you're walking around, it's the safest place ever. I mean, it, we worry less here than we do mm -hmm. any city that we're in the United States. It's, it's, it's just so... Uh, fun and safe and just uh, in Menorca especially inspiring. you just feel like it's oh a peaceful God. fairyland going back in time going back yeah. in time you're completely secure yeah. and safe in your little bubble I know little safe pretty island bubble no pirates anymore yeah no pirates that was hundreds of years ago <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting to paint though totally yeah, that's right yeah. totally yeah. well guys it's really been a pleasure we want to thank you for being here and you're very kind and well, cheers oh, to you. Cheers. Thank you, cheers thank you so much for inviting us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>